Hello everyone and welcome to this video in which I will show you step by step how to fill the ERAS application. And I want to start with the personal information. So once you click on the personal information here, it will take you to this tab where you can see multiple options under personal information. And we're going to start with the AMC account information. Once you click on the AAMC account information, you will fill your first name, middle name if you have one, last name the email address and make sure that this is the email address you have access to because this is the email address that you will be contacted with from the programs so make sure that you have access to this email during the day all the time for the sex you have male female decline to answer and include your birth date you will see here the option of i authorize the release of my birth date to programs because not all applicants want to authorize the release day, the their birth date to their to the programs. So you have to include this here, but you have the options of giving that information to programs or not. Then let's go to basic information in which you have the option to include another previous last name you had, preferred name. And as you can see here, some fields are not required to be filled. You can include the information there, but you don't have to because there is no star next to it while others like the phone number, you have to include the phone number. So also the same with the email here. You need to include a phone number that you have access to all the time in case program directors reach out to you by phone. And here you have the mobile phone, alternative phone, but preferred phone is enough. Just include the number that you, you usually use. If you have other phone numbers in case people were not able to reach out to you on this one, you can include other phone numbers, but this should be enough. Here you can include fax and pager. Now let's go to the address. So there is something called the mailing address in which you would receive mails to. For example, if you're living somewhere and doesn't have a mailing address, your physical address would be different than your mailing address. But if they are the same, you can check this box here. Is your permanent address the same as your current mailing address? If, you, if they're the same, you would click yes. If not, you would click no and you would fill the information for your permanent address. But here you would include your mailing address. You would start with the street number, uh, if you needed to continue more info about the address, for example, the apartment number, building number, the country, city, state, and postal code or the zip code. Now let's move to work authorization. And this is an important question, especially for international medical graduates, because this can tell programs what type of visa are you on, what type of visa are you looking for. So if you answer this with yes, are you currently authorized to work in the United States? They ask you what type of authorization do you have? Are you a US citizen? Are you a green card holder, a refugee, asylum? So you have to fill the option that fits your visa criteria and you know about your visa criteria way more than me. So you have to fill this based on your current status and what allows you to work in the US. Let's say you picked EAD, not the green card holder or the US citizen, because if you pick US citizen, it doesn't ask you any more questions. It just asks you which state you live in. But if you answer anything else, it's asks you whether you need visa sponsorship from the program through J1 or H1B because you might have, for example, a work permit, but you still need visa sponsorship from the program. So if you answered no, it asks you what type of authorization do you have or which one do you will we use during your residency training and you have to pick the appropriate one. If you answered yes, you have to pick, do you need J1? or H1B or both. You can choose one or the other or both. And then you would choose the state that you reside in the US or Canada if you live in the US or Canada. But what if you are not currently authorized to work in the US? You would answer no. And here you would need to answer the same question. Do you need visa sponsorship from the program for your residency training? If the answer is no, you have to pick why uh, you answered no, which uh, status do you have now that would allow you to work during residency without sponsorship from the program. So if you're telling them, I don't need visa sponsorship from the program, you have to tell them what type of work authorization you will be using during your residency training. If you answered, yes, I need sponsorship from the program, you either pick the same J1, H1B or both. And if you currently reside in the US or Canada, you pick the state. Now let's go to the match information. For the match information, you need to answer whether you are planning to participate in the NRMP match. And if you're applying to the match, you have to answer this with yes. The NRMP ID, you don't have now the NRMP ID because usually it's around mid-September. So if, for example, we click on this link here and we go to the NRMP page and let's click on login register. 
and here register for residency it's telling us registration will open on mid-September so you now for this application you answer yes but keep this empty and you can update it later once you have your NRMP ID so you see here if you currently don't have your NRMP ID please enter it as soon as you receive it the ID is not required to certify and submit your application so don't worry if you don't have it if you have it included if you don't it's fine you can submit your application even, even uh, without the NRMP ID so but answer this question with yes if you're planning to participate in the NRMP match are you planning to participate in a couple match so some applicants apply as couple match so they it's a special type of match where uh, the ranking would be different once you rank programs you would be ranking your uh, programs and your cup the other person's programs so if you're participating you're not participating in a couple match you answer no if you answer with yes you have to include the partner's name and the specialties that they're applying for if you're applying for the urology match it has a special match and here you would include the AUA uh, member number now let's go to the additional information here you have to include your USMLE or ECFMG ID and this is the ID that you received when you applied for the ECFMG certification or for an exam or when you received your report usually your USMLE ID is there and once you include your number your transcripts would be linked with your ERAS application the other thing here is you have to pick whether your advanced cardiac life support ACLS PALS or BLS certified and if you check one, check one it asks you what is the expiration date for that so you can pick the ones that applies to you and then the alpha omega alpha status this is mainly for US students if they are members of this uh, society or they have this status it's mainly for students who have achievements or they are top of their class so it only applies to US students and schools, certain schools outside the US and this is another status that you can be part of. Most, most international graduates have this as no. Now let's go to the biographic information. And the first question is about self-identification. It asks you, what do you how do you self-identify? Hispanic, Latino, American, Indian or Alaskan Native, Asian, Black or African American, Native Hawaiian, White or other. So you don't have to answer that question or you can choose to answer it. The main reason why they ask these questions is sometimes programs want to increase diversity or just track what type of applicants they're taking or the NRMP and the ERAS want to see the percentages of different races applying to the match. So don't worry, this will not affect your application negatively. But if you wanted to not answer this question, you, can, you, can, you don't have to answer it. Then we have the language proficiency. So under language proficiency, you click on add entry and then you have all these levels so you pick the language that you want to add for example uh, let's pick uh, uh, Armenian for example and then you have to choose the proficiency level native functional fun functionally native advanced good fair basic and here you can read the description of what that means for example the native or functionally native you you have to converse easily and accurately in all types of situations Native speakers, including highly educated, may think I'm a native uh, speaker too. So don't pick native or functionally native unless you feel that other people perceive you as native speaker. Not necessarily in the accent, but more of a, the language that you speak, the choice of words. So if you don't feel that you're functionally native, you would pick advanced. You don't have uh, to pick functionally native for programs to choose you. So it's up to you and your level and what you think your level is. But if you feel that people perceive you as native speaker, you would pick this. If you are able to speak very accurately, understand very accurately, uh, people have no problem understanding you, but they would probably perceive that you're not a native speaker, you would pick advanced. So if this is your mother language, if you spoke this natively, I would pick this. If like English for most international graduates, they're probably advanced, not functionally native. Let's go to the military information. Here they ask you, are you committed to fulfill a US military active duty service obligations or deferments? You answer yes or no based on your situation. If you answer yes, they ask you the numbers of year, years remaining and the branch. If you answer no, you can go to the next question. Do you have any other service obligation, obligations? So you would answer yes or no based on, on your situation. If you answer yes, you would describe that. And finally, additional information. 
You have first hobbies and interests and in my opinion this is a very important part of your CV because it can tell the uh, people interviewing you who are you other than your scores or your applications so this is an important part and I recommend you spend time to think of everything you've done what could be your hobbies and interests and make sure that you don't lie I've seen some people they just put random things that they have no idea about for example I play piano I play violin but they don't and they expect that this will not show up but sometimes people will ask you about this and honestly in my, in my from my experience this could be the first conversation they have during the interview because in so many instances it you know the beginning of the interview feels weird so this could be the icebreaker oh I saw that you play basketball I play basketball too who's your favorite uh, player if you play music what's your favorite piece so they will have a conversation with you about the hobbies and interests if they align with these interests or not so make sure first that you tell the truth make sure that you add something there and add something for example if you won a medal or you're a champion or you did something extraordinary for the for this specific hobby I would explain that you don't have to include like uh, basketball uh, soccer football you can give like some explanation a line maximum for example I played in my college team I achieved this and definitely you can talk about that in your personal statement you can maybe add it as an experience if it was longer but I would add something brief here about your hobby if if it was beyond just a hobby that you play from time to time and finally the hometown where you grew up now let's move on to education under education you have the higher education medical information and additional information and let's start with higher education and this area here is mainly for US students because they have the system where they do go to college first and then they go to med school unlike in other countries around the world where you go directly to med school so let's read this here it, see, it says since most non-US educational systems do not follow the US model almost all students and graduates of international medical schools will indicate none in the rare cases where this question applies please click add entry and complete the required fields because this section here deals with the undergraduate and graduate school and this is what most US students do they go to undergrad before they go to med school however international medical graduates might have a graduate degree so let's click on add entry and have a look at the options here here you type the institution the location educational type is it undergrad graduate or other let's click on, on, on graduate for example field of study you type your field and then the degree expected or earned let's say yes expected or earned here you type the type of degree so you can see here the different degrees bachelor of chemistry engineering but I want to move down to the masters because you would find several IMGs or US applicants applying with the masters of science masters of public health masters of business, business administration so even if you're an IMG you might need to fill this tab if you have these degrees if you don't have an undergraduate or a graduate degree you can keep this uh, option here empty and go to medical education so now let's go to medical education where you add the name of your medical school so let's click on add entry and click on the country in which you went to medical school so for example if your country was in the Caribbeans and you grew up in the US the country would be the Caribbean like you would pick the country in which you went to for medical school here you would type the name of the institution for example let's uh, type Algeria here you would have all the schools in Algeria you would pick one and then you would choose degree expected or earned you should answer yes because you're supposed to earn your degree before you match so this should be yes and then the degree would be uh, what type of degree is this school giving you for example here you, if you the most common one is the MD which is doctor of medicine but you can also have the different names of that so pick the appropriate degree the degree month and the degree year so some students might apply to the match for example this year in 2021 but their degree comes in 2022 so you can pick 2022 and pick the month for example May April June but you should be graduate by the time you start residency so you should not be picking after July because most residencies start in July and here we have the dates of education because sometimes you have your degree let's say in March of 2022 but your dates of education are only till December of 2021 because you finish your education and it sometimes takes three to four months for you to get your final degree so this is the date of the degree and this is the date that you're enrolled in education and exams in your school so you would include the month and the year where you started 
when you started and the month and the year where your education ended. And here we have the additional information, memberships in uh, professional societies. For example, I'm a member of the American Society of Plastic Surgeons. I'm a member of the Plastic Surgery Research Council. You would include the name of this society and next to that you would include the dates that you were a member of this society. For example, if you uh, enrolled in this society last year in August, you would put August 2022 till present if you're still a member. If your membership expired, you would include the date that this membership expired. And by member, I don't mean that you're a committee member or uh, a president of the society. You can be a member just by applying for membership. So look for societies that, uh, that are part of the specialty you're applying to. For example, the American Medical Association for those interested in medicine or in general medicine. If those who are applying to surgery, they can apply to the American College of Surgeons. So there are multiple societies that you can be part of as a medical student or as a resident. Here, if you have any medical school awards, so if you're ranked first and you got an award or you got an award for best performance or best uh, skill during like certain rotation, any award that you earned in school, I would put that here. And my recommendation for the medical school awards is to explain what does this award mean? Because you might have the X award for excellence. Well, what did that mean? Who is awarded this award? Maybe every student in, in this school is awarded this award or maybe one out of thousand. So I would explain in a line or two, what does this award mean? When did you earn it? So people can understand the value of it. So for example, if you were earning an award for ranking first among a thousand students, I would type the, for example, award of excellence for this year awarded for ranking first in my class among X medical students or just give like a line or two of what this award mean but don't go too long try to make things concise because the CV is only a portion of your application and people should not spend too much time trying to find information and here if you have other awards or accomplishments so here I would try to focus in the medical school awards on educational awards or something that you achieve that relates to medicine but here, the other ones, for example, if you won uh, a championship in basketball during your medical school or during your college, you can include that here. Other awards or accomplishments or something outside your medical school. You might have an award during uh, volunteering or something else. So anything that relates to medical school, especially education, I would include that here. And anything relates to other accomplishments, I would include that in the other box. Now let's go to another important part of your application, which is the experiences. And let's start with training. So training, this is mainly for those who got residency training. And here it says entry for any current or prior AOA internship, AOA residency, fellowship, ACGME residency, fellowship. So if you're someone who just finished medical school and is applying to, to residency, you would keep this empty, none. If you have a fellowship, you would click, uh, or residency, you would click on entry and you would type the type of training, is it, ACGME residency, is it fellowship, uh, AOA, and you would pick the specialty, and then the institution, the program, the country, state, uh, city, program director, the supervisor, and the dates that you started and ended residency. For all the experiences, they have this reason for leaving. Honestly, you don't have to fill it because you can see that there is no star, and you might type because I applied to the match, but honestly, you don't need to fill this. You can keep it empty. Now let's go to your experiences. And under experiences, you have work, volunteering, and research experiences. And here, let's read what they have. Add entry for uh, your ad additional experiences, clinical and teaching. So if you have observerships, electives, that would count as work experiences. Don't count that as volunteering experiences. If you had some teaching experiences, that would also count as work experiences. All unpaid extracurricular activities and committees you have served on would be volunteer experiences. So if you volunteered your time to be part of the school uh, committee for a specific reason and that was extracurricular, not part of your education, that would count as volunteering. If you did observerships, uh, rotations, externship, teaching, any teaching experience, that would count as work experience because now there is no clinical experience. So anything clinical would count under work and uh, you can add each one of them separately. So if you want to add an experience, you would click here on add entry and let's see what we find. First, you have to pick the experience type. So let's say you want to add 
work experience. Work experience could be actual work. So let's say you worked as an analyst for three years before you applied to residency, that would count as work experience. If you did, as we said, a teaching or a rotation, or you did any job outside your medical school, that would count as work experience. Here you would type the organization. So I'm gonna give you an example now. Let's say I did uh, uh, an elective at the Mayo Clinic. So you would type here, Mayo Clinic. The position, what is your position during this work experience? For example, me, I was an electiver. So you can type elective. The position is elective or electiver. The supervisor, you can mention who is your mentor during this experience. It could be one person, it could be multiple people, but you don't have to answer that question because sometimes they know there is no one single person who is your supervisor. But if there is one or two people that you worked with the most and they wrote you your LORs, you can include their names here. Here you would include the country in which this work experience happened. For example, here it would be the United States and the state would be Minnesota because this is where Mayo Clinic is and the city is Rochester. So you can click Rochester. Average hours per week, you don't have to fill that but if you have any information about this, you can include the hours. For example, let's say 40 hours per week. Here you'd have the description and the reason for leaving. Reason for leaving, again, it's, it's an elective the elective ended, that's why you left, so you don't need to answer because the elective ended. You don't have to answer this. If, if there is nothing that you want to convey to the people reading your application. But the description is very important. It's not a required field, but it's an extremely important part of the experience. Why? Because people want to know what you did during this rotation or during this work experience. Were you uh, doing like uh, basic jobs or you were managing a company or you were examining patients or observing care. This is, that's why it's extremely important. And this is the part of the CV that I help with the most. When people send me their CVs to edit, this is the part that takes the most time. Cause you want to describe your experience in a way that conveys what you actually did. So for example, you can say, examine patients on a daily basis. I was responsible for two inpatients or three outpatients. I was presenting cases to the residents. I was attending the conferences or attended conferences presented the case so you would I prefer to start with the past because it's already over and use verbs that indicate action that not participated in or helped with try always to use verbs that presented uh, 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 examined patients uh, took history anything that has an action that would convey that you did something rather than you're always assisting and helping so this is the description important I would recommend filling this on a word document before you fill it in here and make it bullet points so once you copy it in the description it will transfer as bullet points in an easy way for people to read and here you would include uh, which month you started and and the year and which month the rotation or the work experience ended and the year and the same apply for the other experiences so let's speak for example research experience i also did re research at the mayo clinic so you can type mayo clinic and the position is for example research scholar and the supervisor here, you have to include a supervisor because generally when you have research experience, you have to have a mentor or a supervisor who is overlooking your work and guiding you with your projects. And the difference between this section, the research experience and the publications that we will talk about now is that sometimes you, you do a research for a year or two, but no publications come out of this. So you can type in the description what projects you're working on, your responsibilities, and I recommend using these action verbs if it's currently ongoing research project or ongoing research experience you don't include it in the past you can say something in participating in working on uh, if it's something that happened it's already done you can include it in the past tense but try always to use these action verbs under the description and as i said this is especially important for those who don't have publications from their research experience but have the experience because publications take a long time to be published so you might not have publications, but you might have experience. And even if you have publications, you would still include research experience. I had, for example, over 80 publications when I applied to the match, and I still included the research experience at the Mayo Clinic, research experience at MD Anderson. And here I would have the organization, position, research fellow at MD Anderson, my supervisor, the country, uh, average hours per week, and then the description. Here again, the description is very important. Mention the tasks you don't have to if you're working on 40 projects definitely don't include 40 projects in the description you can include the type of projects that you're working on here but the publications 
if they're submitted or accepted, you, they go under publications. But here on the description of the research experience, you can say, for example, I'm working on several clinical projects related to this and this and this. So make it short and brief and concise. If you want to include individual projects that are ongoing but not submitted, I would not do that if there is so many. If there are like three, four, I would try to make that in a sentence rather than mention all these projects if they're ongoing. If they're publicly submitted, accepted, they go under publications. So here, try to make it concise and focus on the experience and what you learned and what you're learning and what you're doing rather than mentioning every single project. If you have one or two ongoing, you might, you might include that individually. And again, I, this is not important to include the reason for leaving. For example, here, date of experience. Let's say you're still working in that institution. So here, if you go and see all the months are, there is nothing that says current or present. So what you can do is, let's say you're planning to apply to residency this year. And residency ends in July of, uh, residency, sorry, starts in July of 2022, if you're applying this year. So what you can do is pick the month that this research experience ends. So if you're planning to stay in this research experience until residency starts, you can pick June of 2022. So you can go and pick June of 2022, which can tell people that the end of this is in the future. It's not in the past. And that's why how you can tell people that uh, you're still working in that uh, research experience. And finally, volunteering experiences. So if you pick volunteering, it has the same exact things, organization, position, supervisor, country, uh, description, and the dates. And again, here the description is the most important part. Why? Because it tells people what you did. Because you might be volunteering in a campaign to end polio, but you didn't go on this. You just, for example, distributed the flyers. You, you want to tell people what your responsibility is during this volunteering experience. And as we said, volunteering is anything that you did outside your school or things that you had to do and you were not compensated for that. Some might ask, is research volunteering a volunteer experience or a research experience? Because you might be doing research, but you're not getting paid and your position title is research volunteer. And the answer is research experience. If you are a research volunteer, that would count as a research experience, not as a volunteering, because you're learning uh, research from this experience and it would be, it would make more sense to include it under research experience rather than volunteering. And it, it sh you shouldn't include the same exact experience under two things. So if you have to pick between volunteering and research for your research volunteering, definitely go with research experience. That would help your CV more. And finally, how many experiences should you include? I recommend not including so many experiences because if you have over 10 experiences of research, 10 experiences of volunteering, 10 experiences of, for example, work, I would recommend choosing the most important ones. And the reason why is if your CV gets very long, the important stuff would get lost between the unimportant stuff. So if you have something that's extremely important, it might get lost between the other things that you included, the 20, 30 experiences you have. So that's why I recommend if you have so many experiences, pick the most relevant ones so your important experiences don't get lost between the others. And finally, here you have the additional questions. They ask, was your medical education training extended or interrupted? If no, answer no. If yes, you would answer yes and you would include why it was interrupted or extended. Now let's go to the license section. Here, the first thing you see is state medical license and they ask you if you have any license in the US and in which state. So if you click on add entry, they ask you about the state, the license type, full, temporary, inactive, the number, uh, expiration month and expiration year. And most applicants, US and international medical graduates will not have a license when they apply to the match. However, some might start the residency and then they decide to switch specialties or they match into a prelim position so they have license in their state and they're applying to the match uh, for the next time for the second time so in this case they might fill that part here here we have the additional questions they ask whether you are able to carry the responsibilities of a resident or a fellow and you would answer yes if the answer is yes if you ever had problems like uh, license being suspended malpractice misdemeanor felony uh, and the answer would be no for most cases for most students who don't have any of these and are you board certified? Most students would be not board certified. So in most instances, people would have this as yes and no as uh, answers for the other questions. But I recommend reading this and make sure that this applies to you as well. Now let's move on to publications. 
I will be using the video that I recorded last year from last year's ERAS platform. The colors are a little bit different. However, every option is the same. I double checked that and I made sure of that. So now let's start with publications. After you go into your ERAS application, go to your dashboard and click on publications. This screen will appear in which you can click on add entry and you'll be allowed to choose from the publication type. If you click on the drop down list, several options will appear. We'll go into each one of these, but let's start with the peer reviewed journal articles or abstracts. If you click on that, you'll be asked to fill several boxes regarding the article you're referring to. So peer reviewed journal articles or abstracts refer to published work. It doesn't refer to submitted, impress, or accepted, which we'll discuss in the next uh, option. So here, this refers to published. And by published, we mean the article has received a volume and issue number with pages. So you'll be asked to enter the article title here, the author name, and there is a specific style that ERAS wants from the articles, which is the last name, comma, first initial, dot, middle initial, dot, comma, and the other authors. For example, John Paul Smith, it would be Smith, comma, J, period, P, period, comma, and you'd list the rest of the authors. The publication name means the journal of the publication, and you would list here the name of the journal. The PMID is a number available in the in PubMed if you look your, your article. Volume, issue number, pages, we'll see that in an example now, and the month of the publication with the year. Let's go to see an example. So this is one of the articles I have, it's already published. If this is from PubMed, this is screen, a screenshot from PubMed. This is the journal of the publication. You can see the year here, the month. This is the volume. This is the issue here between parentheses, and these are the pages. So for if we go back, we would fill the volume with 73, the issue with two, and the pages would include this number here. Here's the PMID if you want to include that. It's not mandatory to include that, but if you'd like to do that, it's available under the article name. And here are the authors if you want to include that, but make, it, make sure to include it in the ERAS form. Well, I want to mention something here that this was an article that I showed an example for. Sometimes the abstracts get published in a journal. And just a background for those who are not familiar with what an abstract means, when you submit uh, work, research work to a conference, that conference reviews usually all the abstracts that get uh, submitted, and they choose few to get presented at that meeting or conference for poster or oral presentation. These abstracts, after they get uh, presented, you can add them in the poster or presentation section, but sometimes conferences publish all or part of their abstracts in a journal, in the supplement of a journal. And in this situation, if, for example, you presented your work as an oral presentation, you'll add it under the oral presentation. But if the meeting published the work in a supplement journal, you can add the same work twice in your, C in your ERA CV because you presented the work and now the abstracts got published. But again, not all conferences do that. Sometimes the conference published part of the abstract, not all. So make sure when you receive the acceptance letter from the conference that this abstract will be published or not in the supplement of a journal. Another point that I want to highlight here, this section includes online journals. And online journals are different from online publications that we will discuss later. Some journals are available only online, but they go through the same peer review process as in-print publications. So if your article has been assigned an issue number and a page number in an online journal, that still qualifies here for the peer-reviewed journal articles. Online publications are something else, but online journals, which is a scientific journal that is only published online, it qualifies here. Another scenario for the online journals, sometimes a journal exists in print, but they publish some of their articles online, but it still qualifies here under peer-reviewed journal articles. Let me give you an example of another publication I have. So Plastic and Reconstructive Surgery, the journal here, it's an in-print journal, but they publish some of their articles online, and you can know that by this letter here, E, near the pages, 
which means the whole article was not published in the imprint journal. So when I looked at the imprint journal, the first page of the article was published in print, but they referred the reader for the online portion if they would like to know more about the article. So this article was not published fully in print, but it still qualifies under the peer-reviewed journal articles. And in the pages here, you would include E and the pages that the article was published in. Let's go to the second option, which is peer-reviewed journal articles abstracts other than published. And if you click on the publication status here, you would see four options, submitted, provisional accepted, accepted and impress. That reflects the process that a paper goes in when you submit your article to a journal. So after you finish your work, you submit your article to a journal, the paper gets reviewed by reviewers, you receive back either an acceptance or revisions, and it, the paper gets re-evaluated by the editor or by the reviewers, and you receive more revisions, acceptance, or rejection. So if your paper is submitted, or you received revisions, but you haven't received the final acceptance letter, you would choose submitted. However, sometimes the journal sends an acceptance letter with minor modification to the paper. So you would see in the, in the response from the journal, they would tell you, your paper has been evaluated and it's accepted, but we would like you to make these minor revisions. In this situation, you might choose provisionally accepted. However, if the word accepted was not mentioned in the response from the journal, keep it under submitted. So if they ask you for even minor revisions and they mentioned in the response letter that this will re be re-evaluated by the reviewers or by the editor, in this situation, keep it under submitted. So submitted includes both submitted but haven't received revisions or submitted and have received revisions but final acceptance hasn't been finalized. Provisionally accepted, they have to state that clearly in the response letter that your paper is accepted, but we're still, we would like you to make minor changes to the paper. Accepted, you only choose that option if, they, if the journal mentioned that your paper has been finally accepted, no more modifications are needed. So what's the difference between impress and acceptance and imprints and publication? Impress, if your article has not received an issue number or a volume. So sometimes a paper after it's accepted, it's published online, for example, and it's waiting to be assigned to an issue number or a volume number for it to be finally published in print or online. But this process, this period between being published online and the final publication is in press. So if your paper has been accepted but not published online ahead of print, it would be accepted. Once it's published ahead of print, but before the final publication of the, of the article, being assigned an issue number and a page number, it would be in press. After it's assigned to an issue number and a volume number, it would be published, which is the first category. Let me give you an example here. This is an article I recently had published. So after we have the paper, had the paper accepted, by a week or two, the journal published the paper online, but ahead of print. Because if you can see here, the difference between this paper and the prior one, let's go back to this one. Although this was published online with E, it has been assigned to a volume and issue number. But if you look at this paper here, it only has the date with the DOI. Because although this is available online, you can see it, you can read it, and it's published, it's published ahead of print, as you can see here and it hasn't been assigned to an issue number and a volume number. So in this situation, you should choose impress and include the same information, the title of the, of the work, the author's publication name, which means the journal of publication, and you choose the month and the year. One difference between this form here and the one prior is the volume, issue number, and pages, because again, the, the three four categories here don't have a page and issue number. The third option is peer-reviewed book chapters, and these has to be published by the time you put them on your CV. Why? Because they ask you for publication information here. So each book is composed of multiple chapters, 
and each chapter has some authors and all the chapters get reviewed by editors of the book. So you, after you choose a book chapter, you include the chapter title that you helped with or you wrote, the name of the book, the authors of the chapter, the editors of the book, the publisher, which is available in usually the first page of the book, the pages of the chapter you wrote, the country that the book was published in, state, city, and the year of publication. Scientific monographs are in-depth research of one issue or topic, usually by a qualified researcher in the field. So if you have this kind of research or publication, you would include the monograph title, the where it got published, volume, issue number, the authors, the editors, the publisher, and the year. Now moving on to peer-reviewed online publication. And again, this is different from peer-reviewed journals that are only available online. Let me give you some examples of peer-reviewed online publication. Up to date is an example of online peer-reviewed publication. Because if you wrote a section of up to date, it gets reviewed and then it gets published online. Stat Pearls is another example of online publication that is peer reviewed. So if you wrote any of these, you can include the title of the publication, the authors, the URL. So people who are reviewing your CV can access that publication and publication date. This is different from non peer reviewed online publications. Some websites can publish work or if you have, for example, viewpoints, and, but it doesn't get peer reviewed like up to date or other online websites. And this would be the place where you put this kind of publication. It asks for the same information. I just wanted to mention something that I missed for the first category, the peer reviewed journal articles. Peer reviewed journal articles include the research article, the review articles, systematic reviews, case, reports, case series, correspondence, communications. So any work that has been peer reviewed would go under the first category, which is peer reviewed journal articles. If the work was peer reviewed or published in a peer reviewed journal. Other articles is an article that does not fit any of these categories. And for example, I published a research I did through the final year of my medical school in the university proceeding. That was not published online. It wasn't published in a peer reviewed journal. So I put this type of research here under other articles and you would include the title of the work, authors, publication name, where it get published and the publication date. Now moving to a different type of research output, which is the presentations. Although these are under the publication, but they're kind of a different way of presenting your research. Or presentations is after you submit an abstract to a conference, you get invited to present your work on a podium in an oral presentation form. And the other form is the poster presentation where you have a poster and people pass by and ask questions about your research work. There is a very important point here to discuss, which is oral presentations are not presentation that you do as part of your rotation or elective, or for example, you presented an article during a journal club, that would not qualify as oral presentations. Oral presentations reflect presenting research work at a meeting. Even if it was your school research day, some schools have a research day each year, that would still qualify as oral presentation. Regional meetings, local meetings, national or international, but it does not qualify presentation that you do as part of your rotations or as I said, journal club. Another point uh, that I get asked about a lot is, am I supposed to include presentations that I wasn't the first author on or I was not the person who's presenting the work? And I think it's fair to include presentations that you did not present personally because you contributed to the work, you did some part of the research work and you deserve to receive credit for what you contributed. But you wanna make sure that people reviewing your CV know that you're not the person presenting. So they, if they want to assess the ones that you presented only, they can know that. And the one that you did not present, they can have an idea of which one are the ones that you actually presented. And one way of doing that is the author order. 
if you're not the first author on the presentation, usually it means that you're not the person presenting the work. Another way is having an asterisk next to the presenter. And in this way, the people reading your CV can know that you're not the person presenting your work if there is no asterisk next to your name. So make sure that the author order reflects the actual author order on the abstract that was submitted. And I would include the presentations in the chronological order, similar to publications. So start from the most recent ones and go down the list. After you choose the oral presentation, choose the title of the presented work, the authors, and again, usually the first author is the presenter, and put the same author order that was submitted to the presentation. If you want to highlight more who is presenting, you can, as I said, add an asterisk next to the presenter name. In which meeting was this presented? The country of the meeting, city, month, and year in which the abstract has been presented. You can add presentations that has not been presented yet, but has been accepted. Here, you cannot add submitted abstracts. You can only include abstracts that have either been presented or accepted for presentation. So if you put a date in the future, they know that this work has been accepted, but it hasn't been presented yet. The same information apply for poster presentations, and you would include the title, the presenters, the meeting name, the country, city, month, and year. Now, after you fill your ERA CV, you would go to certify and submit. You would review your application, make sure that everything is correct, and then you click certify and submit. Make sure that you include everything in here before you submit the application. One thing to keep in mind is that your experiences and publications, which are the most important things in this part of the application, these will not change after you submit your application, your, your ERA CV. You can assign new letters of recommendation, as we'll see, you can do uh, different personal statements, but these will not change, even, even if you got publications afterwards or you got new experiences. So that's why make sure you include everything in there before you submit your ERA CV. After you finish your ERA CV, the personal information, biographic information, education, experience, license, and publications, you can have a look at the CV here by clicking on view, uh, on view, print CV, so you would see that in a PDF version. After you're done with this, you start working on the other parts. The first one is the LORs or letters of recommendation. You have your personal statement, the medical school transcript, the MSPE or the Dean's letter, the ECFMG status report and the photo. For international medical graduates, these four, the transcript, MSPE, ECFMG report and photo, they are uploaded from the ECFMG website. So here, if you click on that, there, it will take you to the ECFMG Oasis where you can upload these. I recommend uploading these at least two weeks, uh, one week max before the application because they take some time to process. So that's why I try to do that before uh, you submit uh, your application, give it some time around a week before the deadline. So let's go to the personal statement here by clicking on zero. And if you wanna add a new per personal statement, you can click on create new. And here you would have the title and the content. The title is only visible to you. So this is not something to show to programs because I'm not sure if you know, in the ERAS application, you can submit multiple personal statements to different programs. For example, if you have a program that is very heavy on research, you can write a personal statement that focuses more on research compared to other community small hospitals where research is not that important. You would focus less on research, more on clinical. If, for example, you're applying for different specialties, let's say urology and general surgery or general surgery and orthopedic surgery or family medicine, internal medicine, you would be able to write multiple personal statements for different specialties. So here, for example, you might say research internal medicine and you would have a personal statement for programs in internal medicine that are focused on research. You can have uh, surgery, no research for general surgery programs that don't focus on research. So you'd have multiple personal statements. In here, I recommend that you already finish your drafts, everything of personal statement in separately on your Word documents and then paste this here. So don't edit this here. This is not, I don't recommend starting the document and editing it here. Make this as the final version, copy paste it from the final draft you have and have it here. And I have a detailed video on personal statements, how to write one, uh, questions that people commonly ask me about this. So make sure to check that out. If you need help with your personal statement editing, also make sure to check out my website and I'll leave the link for that in the description below and in the cards above. And my editing is a structural edit. Even if 
you want to go with someone else with, with anyone who edits personal statement make sure that they do structural edits because if they just change few words here and there it's not going to be helpful to you but the bottom line here have the different uh, drafts of your personal statements title each one of them uh, sp uh, in the correct title so when you assign it to programs you assign it to the correct programs and here you can copy paste it from your final drafts let's go to letters of recommendation to start the letter of recommendation process you click on add new and you mention here the author name who's gonna write your LOR the title for example assistant professor uh, professor associate professor or just doctor X and you would include the department and the specialty that this letter will be assigned to however this will only be viewable to the applicant themselves the designated dean's office and the LOR author so for example if you're using uh, this person's LOR for plastic surgery application but another person for general surgery application you can type that here so you know when you submit the application that this should go to general surgery not plastic surgery you don't want to send the general surgery letter to the plastic surgery and it says this person is very interested in general surgery and you're sending it to plastic surgery programs so that's why if you want to have the same author write you two LORs for different specialties with certain focus on one or the other I recommend that you send them the link twice so you'd have for example Dr. Michael Smith uh, general surgery Dr. Michael Smith plastic surgery and they would submit different versions of their LOR based on the specialty if you wanted to do that and here you have the additional information is it a program director where you did residency residency or fellowship uh, is it a department chair where you completed clerk clerkship training or none of the, of the above and then you have to answer this important question I waive my right to view my LOR because if you see your LOR it loses its values or it doesn't lose its value completely but it's way uh, more powerful to have a waived LOR compared to one that you saw and you know they're talking good things about you so I would say choose yes and don't see the LOR let them submit it themselves so once you click yes click uh, save here one would be added but then you have to click on it uh, click for example next to one of the, the LORs here in, in this box and you would click confirm and once you click confirm you can open the, the, the link itself and you can add the email of the person that you want to send the LOR for because let's say you chose Dr. Michael Smith it would generate an ID number for the, L, for the letter so you can send them the ID and they might be able to log in their ERAS and uh, enter the ID and write the LOR and the better way is just include their email so they would receive an email that somebody wanted you to write LOR for them and they would be able to click on the link and upload their LOR but definitely you have to ask them first you can watch my video on LORs and all the tips for, for related to that and I'll put the link for that in the description below on the cards above so make sure to check that out but after they approve and tell you yes we're okay writing an LOR you add their name their email and it will be sent to them and they will upload it themselves and you will know once they upload it so you will receive an email that Dr. Michael Smith submitted the LOR for you and it will take few days for it to process that's why you need to send them the question the request to write the LOR weeks before the application in my opinion tell them that are you okay with writing me an LOR weeks before the application I recommend like a month or two because these people are busy and you don't want to send them the email asking for an LOR a week before so give them some time they will take probably a week or two or three to write the LOR and then send them the link for that and they can upload it whenever they have time and it will take probably five sometimes seven days to process so by the time you submit your application or the application deadline is these letters would be available for programs because you have to keep in mind because if a program downloaded the application by the deadline let's say the deadline was September 30th and Dr. Michael Smith submitted the LOR in mid-October and if the program downloaded your application on October 1st this letter would not exist in your application and you might be missing LORs and they might not consider your application that's why it's best to have everything done by the deadline some programs wait till like October 5th or 10th or mid-October to download the applications some download it on the second or third day so you don't want to take that risk that's why you should have everything ready by the deadline so you don't miss 
any program from the ones you, you applied to. Some uh, look at the applications later to see who uploaded what, but I can tell you with the huge number of applications, you don't want to take that, that risk. Most programs will probably just download the application and whatever is missing, they will not look at it because they have so many applicants. So it's simple, add new, add their name, their specialty, uh, put their email, they will receive an email, they will up upload the LOR uh, along with any standardized forms that is required for that specialty. So now after you completed everything, the CV, the LORs, person statement and these documents, you would go to the programs. One final thing before we talk about the program, a quick tip about the photo. I recommend taking a professional photo for your ERAS application. Yes, you might take it with your phone or like as a selfie, but I think it's better to go to a professional photographer, spend a few bucks on that. You spent so many thousands of dollars. So spend a little bit on taking a nice professional photo for your application because this is the thing that everyone will see before they invite you for an interview. So I think it's a good investment to take a nice professional photo for your ERAS application. Now let's talk about the programs. So if you click on programs, you would see search program, saved, applied to, withdrawn from, assignment checklist and assignments report. So you can search by the program ID and I will leave the link for the ACGME list of programs so you can find the program ID and type it and you get the program itself or you can search by the specialty. So let's say I'm applying for anesthesiology so you click on anesthesiology and go down so you can uh, show more uh, programs per each page. Let's say 100 per page. So you'd be able to see 100 programs per page. So you can see these are all the anesthesiology programs. So you can see this is an example of a program, the Stony Brook Medicine University Hospital program. It gives you the program code, the whether they have one track or multiple track and you can check it if you want to save it or uh, apply to it. This temple, for example, they have multiple tracks. So you can use this one or the urban based or anesthesiology and they have different codes, advanced, categorical. So you can search all the programs, pick the ones that fits your criteria. So if you go back to the top, you can click on save all selected. We selected one. If you selected, for example, two, uh, you can click uh, save all selected. You realize here we selected two, but it's still two in addition to the one that we chose previously because this is one program. Although we chose two training names, it's under one program. So if you unclick this or click it, it's not gonna change because it's two programs. If you pick this, now we will have three. So now you can save all these programs and come back to it later to decide whether you wanna apply to it or not. Now let's talk about saved programs. After you saved certain programs from the search programs tab, they will show up here. Once you open this page, you'll be able to check the boxes next to each program if you want to apply to one, two or all of them. If you click on this, it, you will be able to apply to all the programs that you save. You need to submit your ERAS CV before you're able to apply to programs. Once you're able, once you submit your CV, you can pick these programs and click on apply and it will take you to the tab where you, uh, you have to pay first and then your applications would be sent to these programs. There is something important that you need to do when you apply to programs. You have to assign the documents to programs when you submit your application because your CV by default will go to everyone. However, the LORs and the personal statements will not go automatically. That's why you need to do it manually. For example, here you can go to the actions next to the program and you can click on assign documents and you can pick the LORs that you want to assign to this program. You can submit up to four LORs per each program. You don't have to submit the same four LORs for every program, but you can submit up to four. Most programs require three LORs for them to consider you, but you can submit up to four if you have more. So you can pick the four LORs that you want to assign to this program, and then you would click save. And the same applies for the personal statement and the additional documents. Your photo and trans transcript has to be uh, checked manually. All the other additional documents will be sent automatically to all programs. However, if you're applying to 100, 200 programs, it might be hard to go to each program and click assign documents and assign for letters and the personal statement. I, in my opinion, the easier way is to do that from the LORs and the personal statement tabs themselves. So if you go to our dashboard here and click, for example, on the LOR, you would have next to each LOR, if you scroll down and scroll to the right, you would see actions. So you would be able to assign this LOR to different programs. So for example, 
the research general surgery aerial OR, you want to send it to all general surgery programs that are focused on research. So you would click assign and you would assign it to all the programs that you saved and at once. So you'd assign this one document to all the programs that you think would be relevant to this document. And then you would go to the second LOR, third LOR and so on. So you would pick one document for several programs instead of choosing uh, all the documents for one program at a time from the programs tab. And the same can be done for personal statement. But what about the additional documents? Can you submit them to all programs at once? Because for LORs and personal statement, you can submit different versions to different programs. But for photos and USMLE transcript, you can only submit one. So that's why it makes sense to submit them all at once to all programs. To do that, you go to next to photo here, click on uploaded, and it will take you to these additional documents. And you can see here, USMLE transcript, the MSPE, the transcript from medical school, the photo and the ECFMG report. For the uh, MSPE and the medical school transcript and the ECFMG report, no action is required because they will be directly transfer, uh, transferred to all programs. However, the ones that you can take an action on are the USMLE transcript and the photo. So let's click on actions here and click on assign. And you can just click this box, which will choose all the programs you saved. Click save and it will be assigned to them. The same for the photo, you click on action, assign. And then click this check box, which will check all the programs and click save and it will be assigned to them. For the ECFMG report, no action is required. This document is automatically assigned to all programs you apply to after it's uploaded. So once you upload it, it will be assigned to all programs. But let's have a look at the MSPE and the medical school transcript. It says, will you, will you use MS transcript this season? Click on this and you will get this box. Will you or your medical school provide an uh, MS transcript to the ERAS document office at the ECFMG this season? And you should answer this yes if you are uploading the MS transcript. So if you or your medical school are providing this transcript, click yes. And the same applies here for the MSPE. Will you or your medical school provide an, uh, an MSPE to the ERAS document office at the SFMG this season? If yes, answer that with yes. If nor you, neither your medical school are planning to submit these documents, click on no, but most students will click yes uh, if you are submitting it yourself or your school. Now let's go back to the programs and have a look at the programs applied to. So after you search the programs, you saved them, you assigned the LORs, the personal statement, photo, USMLE transcript, and applied to the programs, you can see a list of these programs. And this is important if you want to check, make sure that you apply to all the programs that you wanted to, you didn't miss anyone, you can check that there. And if you withdraw from any programs, you can also check that here. The assignment checklist is very important because it can show you which programs did not get your personal statement or LOR or which ones did you forgot to assign it to. So here you can see uh, MSPE, auto assigned to all programs, the uh, medical school transcript, the same. For the personal statement, there are zero programs that receive this assignment, which means we need to assign the personal statement to all the programs that we saved and we want to apply to. And here you can see there are 215 programs that we did not assign personal statement for. So once you assign, this number here should be zero and this number should be all the programs you applied to. The same with the photo, transcript, uh, the ECFMG report will be auto assigned to all programs. So this number here, no, uh, programs without assignment should be zero because all the programs should have all these documents when you save them and you want to apply to them. For the LORs, here you have less than four LORs assigned. The problem with this, if you have three, this might show up here, which might be all the letters that you have. If you have four LORs that you wanted to assign and this is zero, that means you missed some programs. So if you want to assign four LORs to all programs, this number should be the number of all the programs you have, which is 215 in this case, and this number should be zero. I highly recommend checking all these assignments before the application deadline, because you don't want to miss your chance at the program because you didn't submit your personal statement or your LOR to these programs that you wanted to apply to. So that's why double check this assignment checklist before the application deadline. So when by the application deadline, when program directors are able to see your full application, they would see it fully without something missing. And especially when you're applying to a lot of programs, you might miss some. So this is why this assignment list would be helpful. 
And here the assignment report gives you the results per each program. So if you click on, on this assignment pro report and let's say you apply it to Harvard Internal Medicine Residency Program, it would tell you you assigned letters from this doctor, this doctor, and this doctor, and this doctor, for example, four. You assign this personal statement, let's say research internal medicine. Uh, you assign the photo and the transcript. So it gives you a list for each program, not the overall application. From the assignment checklist, you would be able to see the overall application, how many programs you missed. The assignment report, it gives you your results per program. So for example, here, this program, uh, you can see that documents assigned, there are no documents assigned to this program. If there are documents, it would tell you the LOR of this doctor, this personal statement, this photo, and this transcript. So just double check and make sure that you sent the correct documents to each program. And after you finish everything before the application deadline, I recommend also checking the assignment report for a simple reason. You might have zero under assignment checklist. and uh, Everything was assigned to a program, but you assigned the internal medicine research uh, PS to the general surgery program. So here you would be able to see, oh, this is general surgery. It has the general surgery person statement. It has the general surgery LOR, not from a different specialty. So just double check that at the end to make sure that you submitted everything correctly. If you need help with editing your ERAS CV, make sure to check out the service that we provide on our website, The Match Guy. If you have any questions, make sure to leave them in the comments below or feel free to reach out to me on my Instagram or Twitter at Malki Asad, my Facebook page Malki Asad MD or my website, The Match Guy. Thank you everyone so much for watching. I hope this video helps you with filling your ERAS application. It was a stressful time for me last year and I'm sure it's also stressful for you. So I wish you best luck on this application. Hopefully you will match in March of the next year. And, and for those applying in future years, it's a long journey, it's hard, but with hard work, determination and guidance, you will be able to match. I wish you again best luck for everyone watching this video. Thank you so much again for watching and being members of this channel and see you in future videos.